Um, but yeah, no, it's all right. We uh, <laughs> can we just check chance. the check the stream. Seem okay. We got the the waiting for feed come up. Uh, we're good. We good. Okay, then then I'll just introduce you as Mr. Nerd Rock then. That'll Mr. Do. Dylan Beatty, welcome. Good morning. Thank you for joining us today. Good morning. How are you doing? And hello, YouTube. Uh, sorry about that. You can hear us now. Um, one of the hey. undersea cables got nibbled by a shark, but it's fine. We fixed it. So hate it when that happens. How's it? How's it going? You're in England. I am. I'm in in southeast London, and uh, it's going better than it's been going for a long while. Things are starting to open up again, and uh, something um, happened. That, that apparently there was a, a pandemic, so uh, missed that. I, missed I, I, I was never much of a fan of going outside anyway. But <laughs> win win. No, it's we've right. now hit the, the weird situation where I'm getting, I'm starting to get invitations to in-person events, and like you know things are starting to happen. But I'm also getting invitations to online events at the same time, and so I was like, could I do that conference from the hotel room at that conference? I think that's going to be a theme for the next sort of six months or so. I so, think uh, you could definitely make it work. It's like I've so. seen things where people are like. Uh, no, no, it's nothing to do with the pandemic. I just don't like people. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I know people are like, I hate shaking hands. I'm happy if that never comes back. So, uh, but no, things things in London are definitely a, a little brighter and more positive than they felt for a while, which is which is nice. It's been a bit of a slog, I think, for everybody. So, I think so. I think we're all battling through, but I think we should give them something even more look, to look forward to. So Let's... I'm going to hand the mic over to you, Mr. Dylan Beatty. Thank you, Victoria, and good morning, everybody, and welcome. Now, some of you may have seen the movie Apollo 13. If you haven't, you should go and see it, because it's amazing. And uh, there is a very famous line in that movie. There's a scene where uh, this guy, this is uh, Ed Harris playing the mission director, Gene Kranz, and he's just found out there has been this explosion on board the Apollo spacecraft, and he's got a crew of astronauts are out there in space, and he's trying to figure out, he's briefing his team on what they need to do to figure out how to bring those astronauts home. And he comes out with this line in the movie, failure is not an option. Now, uh, the real Gene Kranz, he never actually said that. Uh, well, actually, he did say it. He said it in an interview with the people who wrote the movie in the 90s. And the, the screenwriters, they loved that comment so much that they took that and they made that the, the tagline for the film. And then a couple of years later, kind of life imitated art back again because the real Gene Kranz took that line and used it as the title of his, his autobiography. But, you know, it's a, it's a really great line and it's a hell of a statement. Failure is not an option. Now, what's particularly interesting is the context you know by that point in the movie uh one of the crew has had to pull out because he might have measles so they've they've had you know one failure with the crew roster they've already had to bring in a member of the backup crew uh, during launch the uh, a saturn rocket that was carrying apollo 13 one of the engines cut out early they had an engine failure on the launch vehicle failure but it was fine you know they just they burned the other engines a little longer and they went off into orbit and you know by that point in the whole apollo program they had had countless failures test failures equipment failures some of them trivial uh, some of them there was the the tragic launch pad fire that killed the crew of apollo 1 and so to understand you know the context what does failure mean in this context now the the saturn 5 rocket was built with an engineering reliability target of 99.9% .9 and it had 6 million components 6 million moving parts which means that 6 thousand failures per mission is normal. That means everything is working properly. So clearly failure is very much an option. It's something that was factored into just about every decision from uh, engineering tolerances to uh, redundant systems to training backup crews alongside the, the primary crew for every single mission. So to understand the context of failure and to understand, you know, NASA's whole attitude to reliability and, and systems engineering, you need to understand something called systems theory. Those rockets that took human beings to the moon, they were incredibly complex. Like we said, millions of components, millions of moving parts. Um, half a million people worked on that project over the course of a decade. It's one of the most ambitious engineering projects that uh, humans have ever done. 
And there's a wonderful quote from uh, this lady. This is Margaret Hamilton. She uh, She's probably the world's first software engineer. She led the team that wrote the guidance software that ran on the, the computers on the Apollo spacecraft. And she had this quote, you know, she said that you, after a while, you begin to think in terms of modeling all these things as one system in which part is realized as software, part is what she called peopleware, part is hardware. That's systems thinking. It's understanding the complex relationship between hardware, software, and people that are all working together to deliver some kind of outcome. Now, the Apollo program's outcome, the uh, that one was, was easy. It was the one epitomized by John F. Kennedy's famous speech at Rice University, 1962. This nation should commit itself by the end of the decade to landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the Earth. Now, if you're into the whole agile product thing, that is one hell of a user story right there. This is what we want. This is our definition of done. And it says nothing about how you are going to do it. And, you know, history records July the 20th, 1962 as the date that human beings first walked on the moon. But, you know, when was that story actually done? Because uh, July 24th is when the crew returned safely to the Earth. So maybe that's when we can say the story was delivered. Or maybe, you know, they were in quarantine for three weeks after they got back in case they'd brought back some kind of moon virus. So maybe it was August 14th when they decided the crew were all healthy and they, they let them out, you know. So there's these uh, questions about exactly when that outcome was delivered, but you know they definitely did it. It was a historic engineering achievement. A couple of months later, Apollo 12 became the second successful lunar mission, but it very nearly didn't. Apollo 12 was struck by lightning a few seconds after takeoff. The lightning strike knocked out the whole electrical system. Now, imagine for a second how that feels. You are sitting in this tiny little capsule on top of the most powerful machine that has ever been built. There's you and two of your crewmates in this tiny little thing about the size of a small car on top of two million liters of exploding rocket fuel. And suddenly the craft is you know, shaking and shuddering. There is a massive bang and all your instruments go dark. And <coughs> This was not part of the plan. You know, they had not anticipated a specifically a lightning strike, but they had a procedure, you know, identify the systems that have been affected, work through the options. Is there anything we can try? What do we think the likelihood of success is? All right, let's try that. And there was an engineer called John Aaron who was working in flight control that day. And he had a theory. He looked through all the telemetry they were getting, and he thought, maybe it's just the control panels that have been knocked out, what NASA called the signal conditioning equipment. And that circuit had a backup power supply. Now, if you take another look at this picture of Margaret Hamilton and look up above her head, that is the primary control panel for the Apollo capsule. All of those little dials and knobs and lights and switches, almost all of it, you know, analog or mechanical. And down in the bottom right-hand corner, there is a little switch labeled SCE, Signal Conditioning Equipment, and it has two settings, normal and auxiliary. There was a backup system. The crew knew where it was. They knew what it did. John Aaron sent his instruction up, set SCE to AUX. They flip the switch. The lights come back on. Apollo 12 makes it into orbit. They're like, we got struck by lightning twice on the way up here. Maybe we should just you know, hang here for a little while, make sure everything's OK. And it was. And Apollo 12 flew on and landed the, the second crew on the moon. And if SCE to AUX hadn't worked, there's a whole bunch of other things that they could have tried, right up to and including something called the launch escape system. The idea behind this is uh, basically it would uh, fire the crew capsule away from the rocket and, in theory, parachute them safely back to Earth. This was never used. The Saturn V, it has the remarkable pedigree of being the only rocket in history that has never exploded during launch. And a lot of that is down to systems thinking. It's down to acknowledging that uh, components will fail. Things are going to go wrong. People are going to make mistakes. And if you anticipate those right from the start of the program, you can think, OK, if this happens, and it probably won't, but if it does, what can we do about it? And you frame your definitions of success and failure in that context. The full quote, that full line from the movie, is this. We've never lost an American in space. We are sure as hell not going to lose one on my watch. Failure is not an option. Now, by this point, you know, Gene Kranz and the crew on Apollo 13, they know they're not landing on the moon. That one is scrubbed. They know that they're not going to be doing any experiments or gathering any moon rock. 
they've changed their priorities. They're like, the priority now is to bring that crew home. And they did. You know, Apollo 13 went down in history as a triumph of ingenuity over adversity. But by that point, you know, the Apollo program was already winding down. People were losing interest. America had won the space race. They beat the Soviet Union to the moon. Uh, they flew four more Apollo missions, ending with Apollo 17, 1972. But public interest was waning, and it was increasingly difficult to justify the cost of the further Apollo missions. Didn't matter. In the wings, NASA was working on something new, something exciting that was going to recapture the public imagination and, and you know, interest in space flight. The Space Transportation System. See? Systems again, with NASA, it's systems all the way down. And the Space Transportation System, to give it its, its formal name, actually consisted of three different subsystems. There's the, the big orange fuel tank in the middle, which is the external tank. There's these two things down the side, the solid rocket boosters. And there's the thing in the middle, which is the thing all of us remember. NASA called that the orbiter. The rest of us know it and remember it as the Space Shuttle. Now. The first space shuttle flight was in 1981, and it incorporated all kinds of ideas and technologies that had been developed as part of Apollo, but it also had a whole bunch of new stuff, new ideas, new innovations. And one of the most remarkable parts of the space shuttle program was the guidance computer system that was used on board. Uh, the space shuttle used an avionics design called fly-by-wire. These days, fly-by-wire is everywhere. What it basically means is uh, the pilot pushes the stick, and there is no mechanical, there's no physical connection between that stick and any other part of the, the aircraft. They push the stick, and a computer goes, right, they move the stick. What does that mean? OK, move this flap, move that rudder, adjust the control surfaces so that that control takes effect. And you know, fly-by-wire gives you some amazing capabilities. It can prevent the pilot from doing something which could endanger the aircraft. You can optimize the handling for speed or for fuel efficiency. Uh, you can even, fly-by-wire allows you to make an aircraft behave and, and react like a completely different kind of aircraft. If any of you followed the headlines around the Boeing 737 MAX incidents a few years ago, uh, that was down to, it wasn't a software failure. It was a fly-by-wire system that was getting faulty input from one of the sensors. That uh, looks like that was the, the main cause of those two tragic accidents there. But you can do all kinds of things with fly-by-wire. Problem is, if the computer goes wrong in an aircraft that is traveling at hundreds of miles an hour, and the computer is flying the aircraft, you have a big problem. So you need to take a whole new perspective when it comes to thinking about reliability. Now. Computer systems fail in three different ways. Let's imagine we are trying to visit a website. And uh, there are three things that can go wrong. We can open it up, type in the address, and we get error, 404 page not found, or 500 internal server error. We get an error message. It is immediate. That didn't work. What are you going to do about it? But we know straight away it's gone wrong. Maybe we know exactly what went wrong. Maybe we even have a, some information about how we can try and fix it. or nothing happens. It just sits there, and it spins, and it spins, and it spins, and we wait. And eventually, after some period of time, we give up. Or if we don't give up, the browser gives up, and it just says, uh -uh, there's no web page here. It's, you can wait as long as you want. I'm not going to do that. The page is not available. But the third failure mode, that's the interesting one. That's the one that's more subtle, is when it looks like it's working, but what you get back maybe isn't quite right. It's not the result that you were supposed to get. The computer's giving you the wrong answer, but there is no immediate technical indication that anything is wrong. Now, maybe you look at the New York Times, and you're like, SpongeBob invades Luxembourg? You get your phone out your pocket, and you bring up the New York Times on that, and you're like, OK, well, that says it's a Joe Biden signing a tax deal. And you get your iPad out, and you take a look at that. And you're like, all right, that's also Joe Biden signing a tax deal. So I'm going to go with the, the majority here. The iPad and the phone, they're probably correct. And I'm not going to trust my laptop, because it's not agreeing with the other sources here. Maybe there's something wrong with it. It's got a fault, some malware, DNS, because it's always DNS, You know, one of the, these, these kinds of problems. And if you get to a point where you're looking at three devices and they are all bringing back completely different information, nothing agrees with each other, at that point, you have to assume there is a systemic failure, that something has fundamentally gone wrong with the system that is driving these devices. You can't trust any of the outputs. You need to fail over. 
you need to find a different source, different authority for that information. To design a reliable computer system, you need to anticipate all of these failure modes. And that is exactly what the designers on the Space Shuttle did. The Space Shuttle Orbiter flew with five of these on board. This is an IBM AP101 computer system. It's basically a, a portable mainframe, weighs about 55 kilograms. They had five of these things installed. And the configuration that they flew, four of them were identical. They ran the same software, same data sources, connected via a timing bus. The idea being that at any point, all four of these computers should be producing identical results at any point during the mission, all the time. And if any one of them disagreed with the others, if computer number four suddenly starts giving you different answers, you can reasonably conclude that computer number four has developed a fault and you can stop listening to it take it out of the loop. You've still got three left. And if one of those three starts disagreeing with the others, then you still have a two to one majority. You can trust the other two. Now, if you end up with two computers that are giving different answers, how do you know which one is correct? Now, the safety protocols for the shuttle, they said that if any computer failed, the crew should uh, abort the mission, they should turn around, and they should come straight home. Four computers is safe. Three will get you home. If you get down to two, you have a problem. There is another failure mode they anticipated, which is that all four of these, just like our New York Times example, they all start giving you radically different data or no data whatsoever. If that happens, they fail over to computer number five. Now, number five contained a minimal implementation of the same avionics system written by a different supplier to the same specification. There was no shared code between these two systems whatsoever. This one had just enough code to get the shuttle into orbit, and if it was already up in space, to get it safely back down to Earth again. But other than that, it was completely separate and independent. The thinking here is if there's a catastrophic bug in the code running on the four primary systems, what is the likelihood that the failover system has the same bug in the same part of the same code at the same point in the mission? And they decided that the risk of that was acceptable. That was probably not going to happen, and they were prepared to accept that. Now. NASA's mission protocols, they were incredibly stringent, especially when it came to the safety of the crew. If any one of those five onboard computers failed, that was what was known as an abort condition. You abandoned the mission, you turn around, and you came straight home. And you know, getting them up there in the first place, that had taken an awful lot of planning and time and money and fuel and everything. So the first few missions, they carried a sixth computer, like a hot spare. It wasn't loaded with anything. It was on board. And if any of the primary systems failed, the crew could unplug that one. They could plug this one in. They could load up the software from tape. They flew data tape on board the space shuttle and continue with the mission. And after the first few missions, they decided that the sixth computer was unnecessary. Taking 50 kilos of spare computer into orbit is expensive. There hadn't been any computer failures. Maybe they were being overly cautious. Now, as it turned out, the space shuttle computer, uh, guidance computer, that proved incredibly reliable. It never actually had a, a fault that endangered a mission. But that early decision to stop carrying the spare, that was indicative of an attitude to risk that was going to go on to have tragic consequences. Human beings are not good at managing risk. We associate things that are familiar we think are safe and things that are unfamiliar and novel we perceive as dangerous. Statistically, you know, however you break it down, traveling in an airplane is vastly safer than traveling in a car. But people who are frightened of flying, they will land at the end of a flight, they will get off the plane shaking, and then they will go and get in a taxi and drive to the hotel without giving it a second thought. Now, statistically, the taxi is way more dangerous than the plane they just got off. But that's not how our minds work. You know, our perception of traveling in a car is familiar. We travel in cars every day, you know. And uh, if you're fortunate enough that you have never been involved in a serious car accident, you tend to regard driving as safe. But flying is less familiar. And so when you kind of try and calculate your, your attitude to the danger involved, you're playing on worst case scenarios and uh, news stories and media coverage and all this kind of stuff. Now, if you've ever been involved 
in the rollout of a new computer system, a new piece of software, even just you know installing a Windows update. Over the course of my career, I have worked on maybe a dozen projects that involved a major upgrade to a critical piece of, of business software. Uh, you know, data center migrations, new CRM platforms, all these kinds of things. And every one of those projects, we would go through all the things we could think of that might go wrong, and we'd come up with a plan. How would we know if that thing had happened? What could we do about it? Do we have a spare? Do we roll forward? Do we roll back? Do we restore from backup? What other options? You know, and uh, think back. You know, over your own career, how many times have you? kind of just taking a backup of something on your desktop in case the Wi-Fi didn't work. Or, uh, you know, just, just made a copy, emailed yourself a copy of something because they're doing a big system upgrade tonight and you're not 100% sure that it's going to be working in the morning. You know, we all do this. We, we appreciate the risk associated with things that are novel and unfamiliar. But then after a while, a couple of weeks maybe, the new system's up and running, most of the bugs have been worked at, we relax. And that's when things start to get interesting. If you take just about any system, you know, software, hardware, uh, cars, buildings, anything, and you plot the number of defects against time, you get this shape, something called a bathtub curve, because it's shaped like a bathtub, yeah? Um, but this shape is hiding something really important because the defects that we are plotting here, they are not the same kind of defect. First of all, there are early life cycle defects. You know, new software has bugs that we didn't find during testing. New hardware systems, maybe there are manufacturing defects. We need to replace a component. Uh, machines need to settle in. Things need calibrating. We need to kind of assess our network capacity against production traffic and make sure we've got enough, enough headroom to deal with it. But after a while, things start to settle down. Then there are the, uh, the business as usual errors, what are known as the, the random defects. This is stuff that goes wrong when everything's supposedly been fixed. And this is kind of a constant over the whole operational life cycle of any system. And then eventually, at some point, things will start going wrong again. You know, in, in hardware and machinery, this is because parts start to wear out. Um, software doesn't wear out, not in any conventional sense. But, you know, age is a factor. Frameworks get deprecated. Operating systems get uh, phased out. You know, maybe the, the team who've built it have left and a new team take over main maintenance and there's some components that don't quite integrate properly. Um, maybe entire runtimes are shut down. Does anyone remember, you know, Microsoft Silverlight and stuff? So we have to consider these three different kinds of failures. We got early life cycle failures, we've got the random failures, and we have end of life failures. Uh, the reason they're end of life failures, by the way, it's not like the, the, the system goes, oh, they're going to shut me down next year. I'd better start going wrong. It's that at some point, we decide that the cost of fixing them uh, exceeds the cost of replacing them. And we just we get rid of the whole thing. And uh, we do a big rewrite. And we roll out a whole new one. Uh, and I've been through that a couple of times as well. It doesn't quite go that smoothly. But the operational life cycle of a system kind of falls into these three phases. There is the new system. Stay alert. You know, this is new. Everything has changed. And, uh, you know, we it, it's human nature. When things are novel, we are more alert. We are more prepared to deal with unfamiliar situations. And we're more careful. We're careful to do things just right. We pay attention to all the little indicators that something might not be working. And as things become more stable and more predictable, we relax. We, we're less careful. And that's a problem because it means that we can become blasé about these random errors because we think that they're early life cycle errors. Number of defects has gone down. We think it's going to keep going down to zero, but it doesn't. I said a few minutes ago, when the space shuttle first went into operation, it carried a spare computer. And this was one of hundreds of safeguards and procedures and protocols that were all intended to ensure the shuttle could operate safely. But the shuttle program was under a massive amount of uh, commercial and government pressure to keep flying missions. And so anytime they would schedule a launch, and then one of the safety protocols would require that the launch was postponed or canceled, there was a tendency to look at the protocol and go, well, last time nothing went wrong, it was all okay. Maybe we're being a little bit too cautious here. 
Now, one of those protocols was about weather, a thing called the Space Shuttle Weather Launch Commit Criteria. It sounds very grand. It basically says the shuttle can't launch if it's raining. The shuttle can't launch if there's lightning. It can't launch if the wind is above a certain threshold. If the outside temperature exceeds a certain limit, you don't even put fuel in the thing. They didn't come up with a lower temperature limit because, hey, you know, the shuttle launches in Florida. Who needs to worry about it being cold in Florida? Now, the contractors who supplied the solid rocket boosters, these two things you can see on either side of the fuel tank there, um, they had concerns about low temperature. But they didn't know how cold was too cold. They just knew it might be a problem. And uh, they did a launch in 1984. They did a launch when it was 13 degrees Celsius. And uh, Morton Thiokol, that's the company in question, they're like, um, this might not be a good idea. And yeah, the NASA people are like, really? Are we going to? And they went, well, it's probably OK. We don't like it, but it's probably OK. And a year later, January 1985, it was 10 degrees Celsius outside. They did another launch. Morton Thiokol had reservations. They launched anyway. It was OK. And so the outcome of those reservations was this kind of attitude that said, every time it gets cold, the contractors are going to you know, grumble and be unhappy. We're going to ignore them. We're going to launch the shuttle. It's going to be fine, until it wasn't. January 28th, 1986, a uh, space shuttle Challenger exploded 73 seconds into launch, killing all seven crew members on board. The investigation board determined the explosion was caused by a rubber seal in one of those external rocket boosters that had become brittle and stiff at low temperatures. The outside temperature that day was only three degrees Celsius. Now, the person who correctly identified this uh, Converse, this combination of the, the rubber O-rings and the low temperature is this guy, is a Nobel Prize winning physicist, Richard Feynman. And during the course of that investigation, Feynman, he raised serious concerns about the reliability of the shuttle program and the management culture at NASA. His observations were published as an appendix to the official report. I want to highlight one particular section of that here. He said, uh, we have also found that certification criteria used in flight readiness reviews often develop a gradually decreasing strictness. The argument that the same risk was flown before without failure is often accepted as an argument for the safety of accepting it again. Think about that for a second. Gradually decreasing strictness. You have a risk tolerance that you've come up with you fly with that risk tolerance, nothing goes wrong. There is an assumption, and this is, you know, it's human nature. You think, well, maybe we're being too careful. Nothing went wrong. You drive your car without a seatbelt, you don't get a crash. You're like, eh, maybe all the stuff about seatbelts was for nothing. You know, the attitude to risk, we are just really, really bad at managing and understanding that. NASA officials, they said the probability of the, the space shuttle failing was one in 100,000. 99.999%, what we call a five nines reliability. That means you could launch a space shuttle every day for 300 years and only have one of them fail. Um, Professor Feynman, he said, I actually, I think the estimate of risk is as the likelihood of failure is more like 1%. It's on the order of 1%. It is difficult to be more accurate. That's his exact quote. Uh, the shuttle flew 135 missions and it suffered two catastrophic failures, Challenger in 1986, Columbia in 2003. So I think Feynman probably called that one right. Now, most of us are not working in anything as a historic or as high stakes as, as space travel. You know, we, are, we work in a different kind of enterprise. But that's not to say that we can't take lessons and recommendations from things like, you know, Apollo, the shuttle program, and the, the attitudes and strategies that were adopted in those organizations. One of the greatest things about uh, modern cloud computing platforms, you know, like Azure and AWS, when it comes to reliability, is they give you the ability to respond very quickly, to scale up incredibly quickly, quickly when you need to. Now, when I first started managing large websites, the lead time on a new server was normally about three weeks. It's how long it took to order it, get it delivered, get it out of the box, get it plugged in. So if you saw a spike in traffic, you're like, well, 
what do we do? Do we do we order a new web server? Because that's like you know five thousand pounds worth of capital investment, and it won't be here for three weeks. And so it was really really difficult dealing with inconsistent spikes in traffic. Um, these days, you know, I did that for so many years. I still get excited when I spin up a VM in in a cloud platform and it's ready to go in like two minutes. And I'm like, ah, so cool. You know, it's like. Uh, it's like being able to wait until you smell smoke and then buy a fire extinguisher. As long as you know that when it happens, you know exactly where to get the fire extinguisher, you know it's going to show up on time, and you know how to use it. And depending on how much you, you value reliability and how much you're prepared to invest, you can run multiple servers. You can have active, active replication across multiple availability zones in different regions. You can fail over between entire data centers for just about any foreseeable problem. You can figure out how to detect it. You can figure out what to do about it. You can figure out how to automate the entire process. And all you need to do is pay the bill. Now, Make sure you do pay the bill. It really sucks when you have this beautiful auto scaling configuration and it's all set up and you get a spike in traffic and you're watching as VM starts spinning up and you increase database capacity and then the whole thing falls over because at the bottom of the stack is a single point of failure and it's the credit limit on your corporate MasterCard. The one thing that most people don't have a hot spare standing by for. Now, <coughs> It doesn't matter how much you invest in redundancy and standby systems. You know, Sooner or later, something is going to go wrong that you didn't anticipate. Maybe even something completely outside your control, a zero-day vulnerability in one of your security libraries. Uh, maybe it's a failure in one of the, the undersea cables that you and me and the rest of the internet are relying on to carry data between you know, Europe and Australia or something. Or it could be something trivial. You know, how many of you have worked on systems that use SMS messages for two-factor authentication? You ever consider what happens if one of your customers has no mobile phone signal? There's a friend of mine. Uh, she lives here in London, and she has that problem. There's no mobile phone signal in her house. So to sign into online banking, she has to type in her password, pick up her phone, run out of the door to the end of the street, hold her phone in the air until it gets signal and gets the text message, and then run back into her house and type the code in and hope she can sign in before the session times out. Now, I'm sure the engineers who built that two-factor authentication, they think it works perfectly because the text message gets sent immediately, but it doesn't. From a customer perspective, that is a failed system. You know, it's designed around this assumption that everyone has a mobile phone all the time. And uh, when that assumption turns out to be false, nobody's entirely sure what to do about it. And so the whole system comes down. And if you look at the, the failures, the engineering and technology failures that have made headlines over the years, it's not about technology failing. It's about an attitude that refused to acknowledge the possibility of failure. It's someone going, uh, SMS codes, we'll use them. We don't need a backup system. It's going to be too complicated, too expensive. It's a uh, NASA launching when it's three degrees because they didn't want to acknowledge there might be a problem. They didn't want to take the heat for postponing that launch, you know. Um, it is that, it's that attitude. And part of it is also, you know, the, the conflict between business priorities and engineering priorities, because engineers, particularly seasoned engineers, we're pessimists. We look at any idea and we can immediately think of, you know, 10 ways that it's already gone wrong and 100 ways that it might. And that's also a difficult thing to manage. Now, acknowledging the possibility of failure is essential, but you also need to understand the, the system's view, not just of your product, your organization. You've got to understand how you fit into the world, your team, your code, your company. What are you doing as part of the larger society? What is the impact you're going to have on uh, other people, on the society around you, on people's lives? I to tell you about the post office. In 1995, Post Office Limited, that's the, the company that runs all of the post offices here in the UK, they began to roll out a new IT system. It's called Horizon. It was uh, developed and installed by, uh, at the time it was ICL, who are now owned by Fujitsu. Um, the total cost of the system was about a billion pounds. Uh, they ran a pilot scheme for four or five years, and then in 1999, they rolled out Horizon across the post office network. And shortly after that, multiple post office branches, they began reporting accounting 
discrepancies, shortfalls. The, the new computer system was reporting that money was going missing. Now, I want you to imagine you worked on that rollout. You know, you've just installed a new computer system across thousands of branches that is coordinating millions of transactions per day, different sites, new technology, new hardware, and your employees start reporting that there are discrepancies in the reports that are coming out of that system. What would you do? What the post office did was they turned around to those employees and told them they had to pay the money back or face criminal prosecution for theft. There was no investigation. Management turned around and said, the computer says 10,000 pounds is missing. It was on your watch. You pay the money back and we won't send you to jail. And some people who were not in a position to pay the money back, you know, people mortgaged their homes, people took out loans, people cashed in their life savings to pay back these shortfalls. The people who couldn't were prosecuted. They went to prison. They were treated and prosecuted as criminals. Now, there were years of cover-ups and suppressed reports. Finally, in 2019, 550 branch managers filed a class action lawsuit against the Post Office Limited, and the Post Office settled that for 58 million pounds. Now, if you look through the transcript notes of that trial, there's this statement from, uh, this is Paula Vanels. She is the chief executive of Post Office Limited for, for much of this period. Um, and she said, in court, the message that the board and I were consistently given by Fujitsu from the highest levels of the company was that while, like any IT system, Horizon was not perfect and had a limited lifespan, it was fundamentally sound. Like any IT system, Horizon was not perfect. She knows that IT systems fail. She knows the system they've got is like the others. It fails. But they would still send innocent people to prison and take away their homes than admit there might be a computer problem. This is uh, the right honorable Mr. Justice Fraser. He's the judge who presided over that trial. And uh, what he said was uh, that, that the post office's defense, their approach, it amounted in reality to bare assertions and denials that ignore what has actually occurred. The 21st century equivalent of maintaining that the earth is flat. Um, British judges tend to be pretty understated. For them to say something like that in a court transcript is unusual. Now, <laughs> In 2020, last year, a thing called the Criminal Case Review Commission, they opened the appeal process. 51 post office employees who had been prosecuted for theft. Um, last month, 39 of those people had their convictions quashed. The court turned around. They said it was one of the biggest miscarriages of justice in British legal history. Those people had done nothing wrong. There was no crime. It was a faulty computer system. And... Dozens of innocent people, they had their lives ruined, not by a computer defect, but by an organization whose management culture was not prepared to acknowledge the possibility of failure. And, you know, given once they understood the consequences of that decision, I find that absolutely indefensible. Now, you know, I've worked in technology my whole life, and uh, I'm sure you've all been in situations where a person is telling you one thing and the computer is telling you something else. You ever have that thing if you've ever worked in, in like marketing analytics and you've got a customer on the phone going, no, 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 you, you, our video must have had more than 20 views. And you're looking at the stats and you're like, no, it's 20 views. What can I tell you? You're like, no one wants to watch your video. I don't care how much money you spent. But you don't do that. You sort of say, all right, leave it with me a few minutes. Let me, I'll check the logs and I'll get back to you. And, you know, you go and you don't check the logs. You're not going to request log access to a production system because one customer's upset their video didn't do the numbers. You're going to make a cup of coffee and chat to somebody and then you're going to call them back and you're going to go, I'm sorry. Yep. No, I've checked the logs. Definitely 25. Um, but uh, don't worry. It's, it's going to pick up overnight. I'm sure it will. Thank you very much. Have a nice day. Bye-bye. Click and you know, hang up on them. And, <clears throat> you know, if you've worked in help desk, you've had that customer who is insistent that the file was on the network drive. And you're like, it wasn't. It, it's not in yesterday's backup. It wasn't in last week's backup. And it's not there now. So I don't know what network drive you're talking about. And, uh, you know, you get to a point, you develop a thick skin. You're like, look, I... The computer saying one thing, person saying another, it doesn't matter that much. 
from a systems perspective, this is not going to destroy anyone's life if your video only got 25 views. I'm just going to tell you what you want to hear, and, and you know, but. I would never ever say, yeah, the computer must be telling the truth. Let's send all those people to jail. Let, let's prosecute them. You know, it's about that understanding. It's about being, if I'm wrong, what are the consequences of that? You know, maybe I should check this thing one more time. Now, I love computers. Uh, this image, by the way, if you type love computers into a stock photo search engine, you get images like this. This happy guy is so happy. He's given his monitor a hug. Isn't that lovely? And, you know, I've worked in tech my entire life. It is amazing, wonderful stuff. We are surrounded all day by uh, experiences that would have been unimaginable even a couple of decades ago. Right here, right now, I'm talking to all of you thanks to this wonder of technology, webcams and microphones and video compression protocols and undersea cables. And uh, if we made it to this point in the talk and you're all still watching me, all that stuff has worked, which is, you know, it's cool and it's awesome. But if this mic stops working, I have a spare right over there. If that camera stops working, there's a second camera over there. I have a second laptop set up right here right now. I have a 4G SIM card in my Wi-Fi router in case the broadband to my house drops out, you know. I love all this technology, but that doesn't mean I trust it. But I also know that if absolutely all of those things fail, if every one of those goes down, we can reschedule this talk. You know, it's not like anyone's going to have to cancel their flights or, or rebook a hotel or something. And, you know, this talk is part of a system. It is part of a, a program of events and meetups and conferences that a 1337 has been organizing. I first met most of the gang at Leet Speak in, in Malmo a couple of years ago. And even if this one talk doesn't go according to plan, the rest of that program is going to adapt around it. And that program, in turn, that is part of a bigger system. It is part of this, this connected community of developers and technologists all over the world who come together at you know occasions like this one opportunities to uh, chat to each other to share our own experience to learn from each other i've been part of that community for many many years and i've been astonished over the last sort of 15 months at how resilient it has proved to be and a lot of that has been down to technology but you know a lot of it is also down to people it's down to people being prepared to adapt and to, yeah, it might not work. Something might go wrong, but that's okay. We're going to try and deliver anyway. Fundamentally, technology is just a tool, you know. Whether it makes the world a better place or not, it's down to the, the people wielding it and not just the, the uh, ambition and ingenuity, but it's about humility as well. It's about being prepared to admit that maybe something didn't work. Components fail, devices fail. Algorithms, protocols, even people at some level, failure is always an option. You know, the secret is we got to accept that. We got to anticipate it and we got to work out how do we deal with failures without allowing those failures to bring down the whole system. Thank you very much. Wow. Thank you so much. Dylan for that really interesting uh, talk um, and on the note of uh, slight failures I'd just like to apologize for the, <laughs> the sound issue that we had at the beginning there um, it's almost like we planned it huh I, I actually I asked them to put that in deliberately so that we could see the feedback loop and at that point the folks in YouTube going there's no sound you became part of the system and then we're all one big happy family all working together to get this thing off the <laughs> off the metaphorical ground and make it happen so you heard great it here work first. everybody all you part of a system <laughs> we planned it we planned it to bring you all in we did um, what you might have missed is basically just a recap. Uh, slightly, we just said that after uh, Dylan's talk, we were going to be bringing in Martin Mazur to have a bit more of a moderated discussion before we move on to the QA session. So that's basically what you missed. And coining nerd rock or programming <laughs> rock, or I went for the polite one, but you didn't miss too much, so don't worry. Nerd is um, a perfectly polite word. <laughs> okay, you can use it. Um, we're going to have the question and answer session after we've done the discussion. So if you've got any questions at all, there's been some coming in. If you've got any more, pop them in the comments uh, section and we'll get them aggregated so that we can get them answered at the end. And also there'll be a poll coming up. So please make sure that you vote on that one as well. So like I said, joining Dylan now, we're going to bring in our very own CTO, Martin Mazur, into the discussion. Good morning, Martin. 
Good morning. Good morning. Hey, Martin. Good morning. How are you doing? <laughs> it's good. It's good. It's been an interesting listening listening to the talk. I think we have oh, a lot you. of things to cover. I have a, a rule with talks. I always talk about something I'm interested in because then even if, if nobody else likes it, I had a good time. So, uh... <laughs> well, that's that's a rule. I, I might adopt that. I think it's a good idea. Well, I think we should kick into this, kick it off or we'll kick into it, whatever we want to do. We're kicking something anyway. But let's, let's kick, kick it, it off. Yeah, let's kick it. Uh, and kick it off with um, perhaps a quite a high level question here that you're, I, I don't expect you to answer this in one sentence, but um, what's holding us back from delivering reliable software? Uh, honestly, the. I think it's people's expectations of what technology is capable of and the uh, appetite for innovation and you know the the, the level of new uh, devices performance bandwidth all these things we are constantly pushing that because computers they are not good enough they are not fast enough they are not you know I'm I'm not going to be happy until I have a computer that has more storage than I'll ever need in my life that will, I can literally fold up and put in my pocket, or I can throw it on the wall and it becomes like a cinema screen. And you know, I want that to be able to do 4K ray tracing in real time while I'm also checking email and playing games and all that kind of stuff. And uh, you know, for my my entire life, I've been using computer systems that kind of I probably spent about an hour a day waiting for them to do something. And that's going back to, you know, like a 286 PC running MS DOS 4 is I probably spent about an hour a day waiting for it to do something. If you add up all the little waiting for it to read a file, wait for this to load, wait for that to happen. And now, you know, I'm waiting for Adobe After Effects to render video and I'm waiting for a four gig video files to download and all this. And I'm still probably spending about an hour a day waiting for stuff. And, you know, we could, I believe now we could make a 286 PC running MS-DOS that was like, you know, six nines reliability. I'm not going to say 100% because you never get 100%. Um, and you could run the thing off your own, uh, you know, isolated power circuit where you've got diesel generators and you've got your own tank and you calculate, well, how much diesel do I need to run the computer for the rest of my life? Yeah, okay, I'll buy that much diesel. And you could do all these things, but no one wants that. You know, no one wants a 286 that never crashes. We want an iPhone 12 that maybe once every couple of weeks we have to reboot the thing um, because we want the things that it can do. And that's the, I think, the, the constant trade-off. Uh, you know, the, the, the shuttle example that I used there, that was flying on computers that were already, uh, flew in 1981, and the IBM AP101, I think, was introduced in 1965. So that computer was 16 years old before they even put it in the shuttle, and it was still flying on board the shuttle when they retired the, the fleet in 2013, I think it was. So, you know, imagine now saying to, to your boss or whatever, uh, we're going to take, uh, what's a 16 year old? So, 2004, we're going to take a computer from 2004, like a Dell Latitude laptop, and we're going to make that the flagship component of a product which is going to have a shelf life of 30 or 40 years. Um, and, you know, you'd be like, <laughs> we're not doing that. That'd be ridiculous. And it's like, but it's old, which means it's reliable. And like, no, no, we need performance. We need features. We can't do this on a 14-year-old on a laptop. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that that's the challenge. We can build reliable systems, but the things that it is possible to do reliably are not exciting and uh, you know they, they happen um and particularly things like aviation you know healthcare those kinds of things uh you look at what happens when there is a failure you look at how long it takes to certify new devices there's a really interesting debate about um things like you know smart watches apple watches and fitbits and stuff and whether those are going to be able to measure blood sugar in in uh, people who, with diabetes because at that point you know it measures your heart rate hey fine it's just a gadget it measures your um, blood oxygen saturation and how well you're sleeping yada 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 that's all fine you know the, the the drug and medical licensing bodies don't care but as soon as you measure blood sugar at that point it's a medical device and it is much much harder to sell a medical device than it is to sell a digital watch. And so suddenly there is this whole different, uh, you know, legislation. Well, what if it goes wrong? Who's liable? Um, you know, what, what happens if somebody, if somebody died because their Apple watch gave them the wrong number, could their family sue Apple? 
because with things like you know the, the digital glucose meters that you get, um, there is a chain of liability. The components are all verified. They know which factory made which transistor on which day that went into which board that went to which customer, and you know all this kind of stuff. Um, and that's because you know the, the the we've as a society decided that for those things the reliability is worth the cost, and uh, you know you look at uh, I read the other day the one of the the vaccines for the the COVID nineteen thing, um, it took them forty eight hours to make it and a year to test it, like they they sequenced the genome they went right we put that in there and this is the the, the mRNA vaccine and uh, they're like right bang, done. Basically, it's a blueprint. You put the virus in one end and you get the vaccine out the other end. But then it's like, well, how do we know if it's safe or not? And the only way to do that is to run trials that last long enough that you get to a reasonable confidence interval. You know, there's no guarantees with any of this. It's just about how confident are we? And how confident are we that the confidence model we're using is actually correct and accurate and, you know, we're not missing something. And, uh, and so, you know, we do, there are industries where reliability is, is considerably more a priority. And then there's consumer electronics where, you know, you go to the, the store and you buy one. And if it doesn't work, you're like, ah, piece of crap. And you buy something different. And um, I'm surrounded at the moment by a technology that I bought because it looks like it would be cool or fun or interesting. And some of it just wasn't that much fun. And some of it failed. And, you know, no big deal. Um, the, the system's view of it is that there's a room in my house full of old old technology, and that's not actually a problem. So, <laughs> I think there's so much to unpack in that because, I mean, you mentioned that that you know if we went with the older technology, we would probably be more reliable. Mm. But then that's still not the case because I, I see these systems being built on top of legacy technology new systems being built on top of legacy technology and they're actually less reliable than the new systems because because, because they are not using you understand what i'm saying yeah. if you look at <laughs> a lot of this like oh we're going on-prem old versions of net because this is how we do it in our corporate environment you know yeah. it's been around three years and there's always the veil of reliability like we're you we're using these old systems because we've used them for so many years and you know it's, it's going to be fine and then it's not and, and the, my prime example here is you, we were just messing around this weekend. Uh, I was helping I was helping a friend set up a website, right? And he went like, right, DigitalOcean, uh, put put like Docu and DigitalOcean, put everything in containers. It's you know it's a static website. We're doing way yeah. too much for a static website. Yeah. Cloudflare on top of that for DNS and it's, and all that stuff. And then in the newspapers, there's like you know Stockholm's uh, vaccine portal thing is crashing yeah. people can register and we're like we have better infrastructure on your static website than yeah. they put in their vaccine booking system and, yeah. and and that that kind of just you know that dissonance just doesn't work for me it's i i, I have trouble just digesting those things when they happen it's something you know i uh, the Glastonbury Festival in the UK was notorious for many years that on the day tickets went on sale, the website would crash. And, you know, all my friends working in software are like, we could do a better job. And I'm like, they don't care. They're still going to sell all their tickets. You know, if they engineered the hell out of that thing and, and actually came up with something that could hope with the capacity, cope with the, that level of traffic, they wouldn't sell any more tickets. They make no mm. more money. It makes no difference to the festival organizer whether people six months before the festival are upset because the website was crashing or not. That has zero impact on the system that they are trying to deliver here. And so there's no reason for them to do it. You know, it's like, yeah. hey, we want to give the customers who didn't get a ticket, we want to give them a good experience. There's, you know, effectively no difference between a page saying you can't have a ticket and a page that just doesn't say anything. You don't get a ticket, you're going to be upset, and six months later, the people who did have a ticket are going to go along and have a great time. Yeah. And, you know, that, that I always thought was an interesting perspective on that. But, you know, something like the, the Stockholm vaccine portal, yeah, that does make a difference. You know, this isn't a festival ticket. This is, yeah. we're talking about, you know, life and death here. So potentially, but, but I mean, and, and this is the other thing. I mean, we see these failures. You, you know, as as the failure rate moves towards zero, yeah, the contingencies become less important. Yeah, we, we had this discussion about you know how software is becoming, um, software is becoming like a part of our infrastructure in, in a huge way. Like technology is becoming part of our infrastructure in, in a huge way. You had the banking example with your friend, and you know, vaccine portals and everything. And we're relying on this as as, as a part of society. 
and and then you know we're so good good at building it so the failure rates move down so we go like oh you know we don't need we, we don't need fail safes yeah. most store clerks don't know how to sell stuff uh, if the if the cash registers go down yeah. they're just like you know we're just not making money that day and and you know and the reason I'm kind of equating it with with infrastructure is if, if we look at like power supplies and water supplies and everything, you know, I don't have a generator in my home. I don't have like buckets of water standing around in case my power goes out or in case my water survives out. But you know, there are countries in the world yeah. where that is very much a factor. You know, you do run your generator, you you do keep water around in your house. And you think about, you know, how, how are you going to work when, when the internet goes down? Because you can't just, it's not just yeah. going to work. No, I, have, um, I have family in Africa and there are um, countries where they have rolling blackouts. They're like, we don't, don't have enough electricity. So you'll get electricity between uh, like 10 a.m. and 2 p.m. And so make sure that that's when you charge your mm -hmm. phone and, uh, you know, do anything important that you need to do. And then after that, the power goes out. And, you know, those people, they do have diesel generators in their homes and they do have backups and they do have contingency. And, uh, you know, like I said, the hard part is having a diesel generator you've never used because you understand that if the power goes out, then that's going to be, it's not just, you know, we'll light some candles and <laughs> read a book. It could have serious consequences, you know. It's hospitals like classic, hospitals you know, have backup generators, but yeah. most of us don't. But it's like the classic, right? You, you Do you have backups for your system? Yes, I have backups. How often do you restore from your backups? Yeah. Oh, we haven't had to do it yet. Yeah. Great job. You know, are, are you sure they're still working? <laughs> Actually, the biggest, if anyone wants a, you know, the, the biggest single piece of, of systems reliability advice, uh, restore your backups every night. Restore them into mm -hmm. a sandbox. Uh, sanitize that. Strip out the customer data and use that as your staging environment. Um, that is always, you know, whenever I, I see a team who aren't doing that, it's like, well, no, come on. Look, one, we get to test the restores every single night. Two, we know that it worked yesterday. And three, when we run, you know, deployments and uh, we need to do data analysis, we need to rebuild some indexes. We have a, a replica of production data. Now, it can't actually be a replica anymore because GDPR and stuff, you can't use real people's real email addresses in your staging environment. That's not allowed. Um, but you know, you can sanitize it. There are tools out there that'll, that'll mungle all the email addresses and all that kind of stuff. Um, and you do that, and then it's like, well, of course the backups work. <laughs> they work yesterday. Mm -hmm. And if they don't work, you know about it. You come to work, it's like, oh, the restore failed. Uh, that's interesting. And, uh, you know, one of, one of the teams I was on, we did this. Um, and we, we started off, and when I left three years later, they were still doing this. And about once every two weeks, the restore would fail. And it would always fail for an interesting reason we'd never anticipated. And, uh, you know, it'd be like, okay, right. Oh, glad we caught that. That could have been a big problem. Um, so just we got a, a, a couple of questions coming up in the YouTube chat. You want to go through those now? Are we going to take those at the end? What's the What's the protocol? We're going to close... take those at the end. All right. They're getting close don't to the top worry. of my don't screen you worry. there. So. Okay, okay. Don't you worry. We'll, we'll right. get to those. Bill, We've Bill got some other ones Dylan's getting nervous about questions. It's okay. Uh, uh, you know, because I, I just want on the topic of why I think it's hard. I, yeah. I think reliability is hard. I do think it comes down to the human factor. And, and one of those things I think is, is kind of cultural inside of, of, of software development. You know, you mentioned <laughs> agile and agility. And you know, we're coming into this, or we do have this culture of celebrating failure. You know, failure is good. We can learn from failure. We should fail. Yeah. And, you know, then the kind of move fast, break stuff mentality. <laughs> you can always patch it in production. Move and, fast, break know, stuff. What are you breaking? Democracy! Yeah. Well but done, I mean, Mark. All of this you. kind of, uh, <laughs> all of this kind, kind of builds a, a culture where, where I don't believe we invest in, in reliability mm. because we don't take, all right, I, sometimes it feels like we don't take the work we do seriously. Yeah. It's still just playing around. We're still just building toys. Let me pick you up on a word you just said. You said invest in reliability. Um, do you know anyone who, who regards buying insurance as an investment? Have no, you ever no. heard somebody say, oh, we, we've invested, you know, 8,000 euros in fire insurance this year? It's but a I mean, cost, you know. <laughs> no, I know, but I mean, it's 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 viewed differently, and it's the same thing. Yeah. You know, we, we had Troy Hunt on, and we talked about the security thing, and it's really the same thing because it's it's kind of 
um, what risk are you willing to accept? Yeah. And and in security, we have uh, threat modeling to kind of be like, all right, so how we're going to deal with this threat model? And I've been on teams where one way of dealing with a potential issue is to build a PR campaign. Yeah. Just being like, if this happens, you know, we're just going to deal with the consequences in, in media. Yeah. And, and I think you know that's. It's interesting because that's something we could probably we sh we should build systems that that are reliable and have fail safes. But if we decide not to do it, we should probably see how we would manage that otherwise. You know, yeah. as you say, systems thinking and you know include the whole people thing in, into the into the system. I mean, there's another you know interesting attitude that I see a lot in technology, which is that the only acceptable operating model is infinite growth. You know, anything other than constant growth from now till the end of time is regarded as failure. And, you know, I wonder how many companies are like, look, let's say we just, you shut down tomorrow. You, you know, pay all your employees generous severance. You help them find new positions. Uh, you know, you shut down all of the systems. You sell off all the equipment and you walk away with a decent amount of money in the bank. You know, is that a success or a failure? Is that, has that, oh, the company failed. Everyone got a really nice severance package and the founder retired with half a million euros in cash. Oh man, failed company. It's like, you know, at, at some point you sort of, the, the, this, there need to be other acceptable outcomes than infinite growth, IPO, millions of users get all the things, round two, round three, round four, venture capital. And, uh, you know, there needs to be a where it says, you know what, we got into this business because at the time we believed that we could uh, do a good job, we could manage the risk, we could hire good people, pay them a decent salary and still make a profit. We have new information. Those things are not actually true anymore. We decided the most graceful way of dealing with it is to just go, no, we're out. You know, we, we did good and we're finished and we're going to go and do something else now. But that's not a tech problem. That's a business problem, right? The business isn't uh, like this all the time. You know, tech you, doesn't you... have any problems if you take the business out of the equation. It's just computers sitting around doing fun stuff. <laughs> you have to... You... Yeah, but I mean, it's it's like you need to roll. You know, you when when one of your products come comes to end of yeah. life, you need to take the company and roll it into the next product. Uh, yeah, and and I think that's the issue. You know, we're we're running products into the wall. You know, MySpace. Yeah, you know, we're gonna keep it until it just doesn't until it explodes or implodes. We have a customer. Uh, we have teams working with a customer. I believe they have ninety or around hundred legacy systems. Mm that one team is maintaining. A lot of those systems should probably be end of life. A lot of those systems yeah. should probably <laughs> just be like, how many users does it have? Two users, all right, I'm sorry, two users. System's done. Yeah. But instead we have these, this one team of, uh, I, you know, I, I don't wanna say the wrong number, but let's say there are 10 people. It's not a huge team. Maintaining a bunch of systems and there will be failures. There's yeah. like there's no way for them to humanly make sure that 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 is going to run reliably. Yeah. Okay, I think I'm just going to jump in here, and I'm going to say that I am very very happy for a backup as someone who actually got stuck in an MRI machine when the power went out. I was very pleased oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> for a backup on that one. Um, so if we think about these things, uh, looking into the future a little bit now, what major advance overall, what major advances do you think we'll see uh, within reliability over the next sort of five to 10 years? I think the, for me, the most positive thing is uh, fewer people reinventing the wheel when it comes to, you know, when I first got into doing, doing IT and web development, I, I built network cables. Like I had a cable crimping machine. And I, you know, they talk about this idea of a full stack developer. Uh, me and, and the folks I worked with, we could literally, we could get the server out of the box, install the components, make the cable, plug it into the rack, configure the firewall, build the database, build the website, build the JavaScript, ship the whole thing to production. And, you know, there were lots and lots of steps in that process where um, they were error prone. You could forget something, you could make a mistake. And so much of that is now automated. And, you know, the, the, the trend towards uh, you know, using packages as opposed to, to reinventing things. I don't think it's necessarily always an improvement. What I think it's done is to kind of reframe the question. It's not, uh, we've got 10,000 lines of code that we wrote now. It's like, well, we got a million lines of code that we got from 
NPM or from NuGet, but it's probably okay because lots of other people are using the same code. Uh, there's, was, was it Eric Raymond, the famous quotes, given enough eyeballs, all bugs are shallow? Um, the, the more people get exposed to something, the more people are using it, the more likely it is that the quality of that is is going to, or at least we'll be aware of the defects. Uh, you know, you won't have this thing where the company's running a, a crypto algorithm that Bob wrote on his laptop at the airport, and then it turns out it's not crypto at all. It just looks like crypto, and now all your data's cracked wide open. Um, and I think, you know, that's a, that's a positive trend, sort of moving away from... Uh, um, you know, reinventing and, and bespoke implementations towards commodity hosting, commodity cryptos. You know, sites like Cloudflare. I think Cloudflare is fantastic. I run uh, all my my personal sites and stuff through it. I use it for DNS. And people have their reservations, like, oh, you're giving them too much control. It's like, yeah, but I want that control to be in the hands of people who are good at it. And I'm prepared to accept that, you know, I'm not going to do that myself. I ran my own mail server for years, like literally about 20 years. Um, I ran my own physical box that hosted all my email, and then I ran my own virtual server. And eventually I gave up because I was just sick of the amount of admin it required to stay ahead of the spammers and the anti-spammers and that whole kind of arms race that was going on. Um, so now I pay someone to do that. And that's one more thing where uh, it might go wrong, but it's less likely to than when I ran it myself. Now, it's frustrating when something goes wrong and you can't fix it. You know, we're, we're hackers, we're tinkerers. We like to feel like, well, if it stops, we can take it apart, figure out how it works and put it back together. But actually, I think being prepared to let go of that and be like, there are things here I do not understand, and I will just trust that they work correctly, in most cases is going to deliver a more reliable system than insisting that every single thing in there was, uh, you know, you wrote the code, you re or your company, you wrote it, you reviewed it, you deployed it, you manage it, you understand it, and then you're like, wow, we're trying to invent our own crypto protocols and our own social media and our own email and our own message queue, and it's actually all getting a little bit hairy. Maybe we shouldn't have invented all these things ourselves. Um, but yeah, that, that's, a, that's the trend that I think we're going to see, is uh, more and more stuff. There's a guy called, have any of you heard of Simon Wardley and a, a thing called Wardley Mapping? Um, it's a, a, a technique that he's come up with for tracking uh, kind of priorities and business actions and these kinds of things. And one of the very interesting things that came out of his work is uh, the concept of um, pioneers, settlers, and town planners. And you know the pioneers are the people going out into the uncharted wilderness. They're the first people there. And the first wave of that, they accept an amazing amount of risk. And a lot of them don't make it, but the ones that do get rich. But then the settlers come along later, and things are a little bit, they have a map. They know where they're going, at least. And for them, it's a little bit more civilized. And eventually, you get to the point where there's people going, all right, well, where are we going to put the schools? And where are we going to put the roads? And where should we put the power station? And you know, the, the, I think a lot of things in tech, um, the pioneers are the exciting ones. The, you know, the, the people who uh, stand up at conferences and go, look what we managed to do. And you're like, that is amazing. And I'm terrified, you know. Um, but it, it settles, it stabilizes. And these things become, it goes from pioneering to settling. And people, well, we took the bleeding edge thing and we, we kind of fixed it up a bit and we used it on a production system. And then eventually it's like, yeah, right click, install, bang, done. There you go. You've, you've got that now. Um, and uh, so, yeah, there's some, some interesting stuff on his work about uh, Simon Wardley's work about commoditization and how things go from being uh, new and exciting, the days when, you know, there were 10 factories in the world that had electricity and they all used a different voltage and they all had their own electrical generators that were maintained by a team of engineers. And now it's like, well, there's a hole in the wall, you know, bang, plug it in. There you go. <laughs> I, I do think that's super interesting because, because this is definitely the trend we're seeing. And, and I think that this means that most software developers are just going to have to like find other skills that they get really good at instead of the classical skills they used to have. Mm. Uh, and, and, and it's also like, it's been a mind shift because I remember when I was, it has to be like 15 years ago, even further, further back, we were building C++ systems. And I remember we were fighting management to get to use a library called Boost yeah, instead of just coding our own so stuff templating like, for c plus plus right yeah yeah like, this is good it you know it, it's gonna you know make everything better there's more eyes on it they're like oh we're, we don't trust it and and you know once we got there everything we got rid of so much code and the system yeah. got so much better um and and i think this is this is kind of the trend again you know coming back to my weekend experiment we also use something called auth zero 
to implement like it, just yeah. authentication and all of these things I, I was telling my friend you know if we did this 10 years ago this wouldn't have been you know a, a couple of hours over a beer this would have been like a whole you know micro project with all the servers and everything we got going but at the same time you know what scares me you know i'm trying to be technology positive but what scares me is kind of the centralization of all of these things mm. right because now we're creating these single points of failure that you know they shouldn't it shouldn't happen like aws shouldn't go down but but what if it does like now now half the world is out and, <laughs> and, and you know we have this issue well it's another know... thing the other thing I'm, yeah. I'm also thinking about is um a lot of companies view source code as as like an asset but you know it's <laughs> it's actually a risk right and you don't want to keep you don't want to keep your risk you want to share it so so yeah. you know, this is why open source works because you're just going like i don't want this risk it's yours and and, and there's now there's a community of people sharing that risk uh, and I, and i think that's also a mentality that we see mature corporations going into Microsoft open sourcing more of their stuff and so on and so forth, just because you know we just want the eyeballs, we want the people to look at it. Uh, we're not afraid that anybody's going to steal it, because this is not our business anymore. The, you yeah. know, owning the source code is not our business, uh, and and I think that's also a shift we will see uh, in, in years to come. You know, F Facebook could easily open source the platform because nobody's going to be able to steal Facebook's business at this point, even if they had the source yeah. code. <clears throat> well, well, talking about these, uh, if we could come back to what we're talking about, the advances that we think are going to happen in the next five to 10 years, what do you think it is driving these advances a little bit more? <laughs> Boom, mic drop. Money. Yeah, I, I was gonna say I'm cynical, but it's it's just it's just money. Um, it, it's, well, it's definitely it's... Def definitely um, it's that, and it's it's boredom in a sense as well because software developers hate to repeat stuff. Uh, I know, you know, I remember when we were still doing ORM mapping, and and in the beginning of ORM mapping, you were you had to write all the objects you didn't have generators. Yeah. So you wrote the database, you wrote the objects in C sharp, and you were like, all right, you know, now it's and then you did the small factories to copy over all the fields. And and, and eventually somebody got fed up with that, says like ORM mapper, like you don't have to worry about it. Now we have like dynamic object generation. We don't even, you know, have object databases. And that's all coming from, you know, people being like, I'm not gonna do the tedious repetitive stuff. Yeah. I can actually do the meta work to automate my own work. And that's where kind of, you know, containers and cloud and, and serverless and all of this stuff comes from one, a business drive, but two, also just software engineers being like, no, I'm not writing that code again. I already did it once. Yeah. No, I think that's, that's very, very true. You know, the, the developers tendency to automate the things which are tedious and then to, you know, you, you, you shift that that little shift in thinking, I have to solve a problem. I'm going to solve my problem. I solve my problem 10 times, 100 times. I'm going to invent a problem solver. And then at that point, you're like, oh, I can think of so many other problems that my solver can cover. Mm -hmm. And you start extending it. And congratulations, now you're a framework developer or you're a tool <laughs> author. And, uh, you know, you put it out there. And, and sometimes that's great. You know, it, it genuinely does uh, solve a lot of problems for a lot of people in a way that's very, very conventional you know i'm thinking about a auto mapper for me is is a classic you know one of the best open source things out there uh does one job does it well and is very much like no we're not adding that capability we really don't want to and uh you know that that exactly the example you know i remember sitting there and going customer.name equals record.name customer.phone equals and it was you know it was good work to do with a hangover it was kind of meditative and but it wasn't valuable work by, by any stretch of the imagination. yeah i know <laughs> Uh, it used to be, I, I say to people, you know, one of the biggest changes in software and at the time I've been here is that we used to, uh, you could have a two hour meeting on Monday morning to decide what to do and then it'd take you the rest of the week to do it. And now you spend, you know, four days figuring out what to do and then you do it on Friday morning. 
Mm. And that's definitely, you know, automation, tooling, infrastructure. Um, and also, I think, shifting the, the emphasis away from just the, the sheer technical implementation yeah. to actually we're trying to build a product here that people are going to use and pay for and get value out of. You know, I, I think what do we need to get right? I think <laughs> yeah. that's what I'm talking about. You know, software developers need new skills because now all of a sudden there will be required some kind of product thinking and people thinking and probably business thinking if you're working in a corporation yeah. uh, out of the software developers because it's not just about the tech anymore. It's just not, not about writing the code because when I started working, you know, you got specs and the specs were so detailed. It was basically re-implementing this text in C++ yeah. uh, and, you know, making the stuff do inputs and outputs. And I didn't really care about the business. Yeah. And I don't believe you know, we will have that luxury. I don't believe we have the luxury today, but in five years, definitely not. Yeah. Like if you're not involved in, in the product that you're building and understanding what value that's adding to the world yeah. and, and to your company, <laughs> like you, you have a problem. It's interesting you refer to it as a luxury because there are, there are definitely days where it was, but there are also definitely days when the developers are like, what do you mean we're all fired and there's no money? The code worked really well. We normalized the database. What do you mean the company is failing? And uh, that comes back to you know systems view. It's like you need to, to be good at your thing, but also if you don't understand how your thing fits into the world, um, then you're, you're setting yourself up for all kinds of uh, unpleasant surprises when uh, you realize what your users are actually using your product for. But I, think, I, I also think we need both. I think, I think this is the trick here because a good classical story, which actually happened, was I was sitting with, with one team, it was a few years ago, and we had just brought on a junior developer into that team. And I was, I was, I was standing and I was mapping out this grand architecture or thing, and you know, we were all sitting around a whiteboard and talking and drawing, you know, a time where whiteboards were still a thing. Uh, and, and, and then all of a sudden, I just hear from the corner of the room this... this, this uh, the, this man goes like this junior goes uh i'm i'm done i was like done with what he's like i'm done with the feature i was like no you're not like we're still kind of drawing boxes and arrows he's like no i'm done i was like show show me and, and, and he shows me i was like wow I was like what did you do he's like i took this npm package and this npm package and that npm package and i wrote these things and it's like it, it's like seven lines of glue code yeah and i'm like wow that that's impressive but all of us you know everybody else in that team were like coming up on seven ten years experience and we were like we need to get the foundation going yeah and you know it's awesome if we can just strain stuff together but then somebody needs to be able to debug that and fix the packages when they yeah. break yeah. and and i think that's what i mean we need both because if you have a team with too many people just gluing packages together and yeah. nobody actually understanding what's going on in the and you know in the bottom layers you know what's the what, what is a container what's the container doing you know what's yeah. my what, what what are these things how are they connected when it breaks you don't really have resilience you don't really have that that reliability that you need okay if i can just jump in there and tell you that whiteboards are still most definitely a thing martin you can't take a White away from me. I haven't had a um, whiteboard you... for one and a half a half years now. I'm, <laughs> I, I, I'm not sure they are. I, I don't have, have I one have... in my house. <laughs> I don't use one in my meetings. It's you know maybe maybe this is the death of whiteboards. I have no. self-adhesive whiteboard. I got those sheets that you can tear off and stick on the wall and scribble on, um, and I use those for all kinds of things. <sighs> Problem is, I, I never look back at them. I, I use them to think, and then I, they just sit on the wall, and then I, I take them down and throw them. I, I, I use them to I, love I bomb. I mean, <laughs> like when, when, when all this pandemic stuff is over, I'm just going to have a bunch of whiteboard meetings because I miss them. When when this I is use over, we just love bomb the whole office so that they know I'm like, hi, I think you're great. Have a great day. <laughs> we we used to have a, a thing, a place I worked where if you were leaving the meeting, you had to leave the most confusing diagram you could on the whiteboard. So it'd be like, you know, hexagon in the middle with partration and then an arrow with redundancies, question mark, and another arrow with bees, and then you just <laughs> leave it there. And you know, I have no idea what it, what it did to eventually people figured this out and you come back and they hadn't erased it. They just added a couple more notes to it and these things. And you know, then the MD would walk in and be like, what, what have you been doing? It's like, oh, don't worry about that. That's just a side project. So. <laughs>
Okay. And you mentioned it slightly, you touched on um, cloud uh, yeah. when we started talking about the um, advances that we think are going to happen in the future. Uh, and now that almost every system is hosted on one of the major cloud providers, how will the emergence of cloud affect the reliability of software, do we think? When it fails, it's all going to go down together, <laughs> which is, in a way, I'm sort of OK with that, because uh, as a, a, you know, as, as an engineer working on system reliability, um, it's I would rather be in a like, no, it's Amazon is down, like everything. Netflix is down right now. Amazon.com is down. Everything's down uh, when they're back up. Come and talk to us but there's nothing we can do in the meantime. And the whole world is yelling at them. So we're going to take the afternoon off and just wait for it to fix itself. And, you know, it doesn't improve your reliability metrics, but it does, you know, give you a more relaxed way of, of getting things back online. Um, and that's, you know, certainly uh, I, I have seen per, first uh, firsthand both sides of that you know i've run systems where we had a you know trivial outages like we need to reboot that server whatever we've had the thing where someone put a backhoe through the fiber cable to the building and boom we're offline for 36 hours until we can get a, a backup and then you know we migrated the whole thing first to private cloud and then onto one of the big uh, cloud platforms and uh, we still you know the the downtime it improved it didn't disappear we still had occasions when we were unavailable and uh, it took a little while to get the the business stakeholders to understand that this is not our problem you know this is like a power cut um we just sit around and wait for it to come back but once they got it things became more relaxed not necessarily more reliable but we were like no it's down but you know what there's nothing we can do we're going to keep working on what we were doing earlier and uh, it was less disruptive to our routine when those things happened um and yeah it is you know say to someone we're done it's like well yeah so is netflix they're like oh all right yeah okay big deal yeah and like when netflix comes back up we'll be back so go and sit and click refresh on your tv until it starts playing movies again <laughs> i mean you're outsourcing both control and responsibility at the same time which i, yeah. I think is it, it's a nice combo when that is the business case you want to go for uh you know there, there's only a handful of clients that i spoke to that have a really good reason to still run on-prem stuff yeah and that's a really good reason. Yeah. Um, and, you know, they've been doing it for so long and they keep redundancy and all of that stuff anyway. Are you able to tell us what the reason is or is it classified? Uh, it's it's usually security reason, uh, yeah. a security reason or, or a nation state uh, type of uh, reason yeah. because they don't want stuff going outside of Sweden and we don't really have cloud in Sweden. And they also need to make sure that all the personnel <laughs> that has access to those physical machines is, is yeah. uh, you know, is of a certain security level. And, and, and then, you know, you go like, all right, fine. But at the same time, they almost run like cloud stuff. Yeah. Just that they're doing it on their own servers. So, um, so, so I, I think it's that kind of feeling of, are we okay with giving up control? And then I would say 99.9% .9 of, of business cases, you shouldn't own that infrastructure in, in yeah. that that way. No, I agree. It's like electricity. You know, it's it's becoming a commodity that, if you are going to accept the responsibility for managing that piece of infrastructure yourself, you need a really, really good reason, and not just a good reason, but you need to revisit that reason constantly because you are going to be paying a huge premium every single day that you are in operation. And if you leave it too late to realize that the rules have changed, then somebody is going to come along and eat your lunch. But what I find what I find interesting, which is maybe maybe not on the topic of reliability, but on the topic of, of, of cloud right now, is products like Paper Space or or Shadow, uh, where you run you know really really powerful desktops that you pay by the minute in the cloud, which for mm. people working with uh, like like engineering and uh, yeah. CAD systems and stuff like that, or AI or compute is is awesome because now all of a sudden you don't have to own these huge machines with a million, uh, a million GPUs yeah. in your house. You just run it when you need it on the cloud. I did um, actually do a little back of the envelope calculator. I do lots of stuff with uh, after effects and premiere and it's like 
if I put this, if I spin up a really big VM in the cloud, I can render it there. But then I need to get the 15 gigs of video back to my house to do the next bit. And uh, well, that's not actually quicker. <laughs> it's just instead of being a processing bottleneck, now it's a download bottleneck. Um, but you know, you know where the bottleneck is. You can track it and, and wait for the conditions to change. But I mean, it, it might become a reliability issue if we move to to more to to thin clients again. Mm. You know, if everybody's just running around with a Chromebook connected to this yeah. massive machine in the cloud, uh, you know, that that's also a scenario as connectivity improves. Um, and and when, when we're online, we're online all the time anyway. So. Yeah. All right. <laughs> well, I think now it, we're speeding along really, really quickly. Uh, we've now only got about 35 minutes left before we stop bothering people with this subject for the day and let them get on with the day. So I think we should let in some of the audience questions. So uh, you still got a chance to uh, send in any to us now, again, in the comments box. And also, I don't know, comments box might be there. Um, or there's the, the poll as well. So if you can just uh, get in there and go on there. So let's kick off some of the audience questions that have been sent in so far today. Um, so we'll kick off with, do we have the correct legislation to hold people or corporations responsible for serious software failures? What do we think? <laughs> um, I don't know, but I think if we did, we would still be running MS-DOS on 286s. I think if there was, you know, corporate or personal liability, you know, all software comes with, you know, the, the it's free and if it doesn't work, you get your money back. That's basically it. And, you know, even things like hosting contracts, you know, I've, I've uh, signed deals with data centers that were like, well, we'll give you 99.99% .99 uptime. And if there's any downtime, then we'll just refund you for the, the four hours you were offline. And it's like, that's kind of not good enough. Um, but, you know, a question that I, I, I often sort of think about and ask people is, uh, would you, if someone came to you and said, we want you to write some software for us, but if it doesn't work, you'll go to jail. Um, how much, you know, under what conditions would you accept that contract? What would, you know, is there any, would you be like, okay, I'll do it, but I specify the hardware, I specify the operating system. Do you just be like, yeah, all right. Um, and you take the money and you run as fast as you can so that when it fails, they can't find you. Or do you actually go through the process of, of validating every single element in that stack? And then what happens when something like Meltdown or Spectre comes along? And you're like, well, nobody told me that there was a systemic flaw in the manufacture and design process of all CPUs made for the last 15 years. And they're like, oh yeah, but you certified the system. So uh, here's the handcuffs, come on. You know, um, you know where, where is the, 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 I quite like the fact that as a developer, you know, you, you are not immediately liable for any failure, which could be attributed to a line of code that you wrote. Uh, and the flip side is, you know, you write a line of code that makes someone 10 million euros. You don't go and, hey, I, that's my code. I want all the money. It's, you put it on NPM, someone downloads your package, they use it to get rich. You don't get rich. And maybe mm -hmm. that's something, you know, that could uh, redress the balance. Like it needs to, if there's going to be liability on the one side, there needs to be a, some kind of, you know, acknowledgement and remuneration on the other side. Um, and maybe that's something, you know, say to people, you put a package on. This is me thinking out loud, by the way. None of this is premeditated. Some, so if some, you're watching it. <laughs> something's going to happen. Something's going to yeah. happen because there's two major trends that, that I see that I find are really interesting when it comes to this. So, so um, one is, you know, not naming names, but there's been an increase in, in quite tough contracts. So this isn't legislation, but this is contracts between companies mm. where the people that want to enter the contract explicitly say, you know, if this breaks, we're going to come after you hard. So make sure you price this project in a way that, yeah. you know, you can afford the, the, you know, the backlash when it fails because they are trying to push uh, responsibility off to suppliers or software vendors saying like we don't only want to buy the software we also want to buy reassurance you know or insurance that that it doesn't break and we want you to price that into the project we want you to price that in so you can afford when we come after you mm -hmm. and, and I think that's one thing that you know I, I didn't see that before 
uh, we, we haven't entered any contracts like that, <laughs> but I've, th there's, there's been asks for that type of work. Yeah. And, and it's super interesting. And, and the second one, I mean, now I might be misquoting on this, but there was an art article uh, here in Sweden about bridge collapsing. And I and the engineer that because they found found that error in the bridge was some some tolerance calculations in the in the in the drawing or respects of the bridge, and the engineer uh, engineer actually got uh, got um, I don't know if he got sentenced or at least he got uh, got indicted for mm. for you know something 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 with that bridge, and you know if that's happening in the physical world, yeah, you know seeing that cross over to software eventually is not that unlikely. Mm, yeah. <laughs> you have something I, more to add? Yeah, I was just going to say, you know, engineering is, a, is an interesting one because uh, the, you know, the process of designing and, and building, you know, constructing, constructing a building involves a lot of individuals who potentially, if they make a mistake, then the whole thing doesn't work. Um, there's the, one of the, the newspaper headlines on a slide in my talk was the, uh, the Kansas City Hyatt, which was a, a, a walkway in a hotel atrium that collapsed and it killed a lot of people. It killed, I think about a hundred people. Um, and that was, uh, it was a change done on site to the design of these raised balconies in this hotel that uh, nobody realized, like, you know, the person made the change and they went, we doing it this way is going to be a pain in the ass. Can we do it this way instead? And they kind of looked at it and went, yeah, that's probably fine. And it wasn't fine. They'd missed a really, really vital kind of detail in the, in the recalculation. Um, and, uh, you know, that went down in, uh, I don't know about the immediate like liability for the contractors concerned, but that resulted in changes to building code and legislation and regulations around what you are required to do. But, you know, sooner or later, you uh, you, you have a bu bunch of people looking at a thing and trying to decide, is this going to work or not? And if all of them make the same mistake, it's going to fail. And, mm -hmm. you know, at that point, the, the question is, well, where is the where is the social value in, in applying, you know, criminal or, or financial consequences to those individuals other than you kind of ruin their lives as a warning to others? And is that going to make people better engineers or is it going to make them go, I'm not touching engineering. I don't want the liability, you know. Um, we don't know. It's it's still... That's interesting. I, I'm, I'm not, I'm, <laughs> I'm usually not in favor of coming after the individuals because yeah. the individuals, but I do think that, for instance, you know, if, if we look at like GDPR and, and then the the massive uh, positive change it has had in how yeah. people manage data because yeah. now there's actually a consequence uh, kind of connected to, to yeah. a data breach or, or, or a failure. So, so all of a sudden, when we talk to people who want to build software, they're like, oh, what about GDPR? What about security? What about this? And we're like, awesome. You finally started caring about these things that we've been talking about for so long. Yeah. And I think the question is, you know, in almost all these situations, the worst case scenario is bankruptcy. The the company, the corporate entity, they get slapped with a fine that is more money than they have, and so they go out of business. Um, and that's it. You know, that it, it ends there. Anyone who who has a, a claim against that company gets to join the queue of creditors, and maybe there's some money left when the lawyers are finished. The question is, do we go further? Do we go to a point where it's like, well, you, you know what? You made a, a mistake or malicious intent. You know, you did something. Um, we find you. Your company is out of business, but now we are going to take you to court and we are going to prosecute mm. you, and you are going to lose your home, or you are going to serve time in jail, or you're going to have a you know restraining order that says you are never allowed to run a company ever again. And I mean, maybe there's a lot of people got very very rich in tech for not really doing very much work. Maybe there's a kind of way of saying, well, you know what? There's two ways you can do this. You keep all the money and you accept all the liability. Or you're like, no, 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 you you, you make a reasonable living out of this. And um, if it all comes crashing down, we won't come after your house. But, uh, but you know, it's... The it's, issue yeah. becomes when we produce systems and software that, that actually are, when they malfunction, uh, hurt people. Like yeah. physically kill or hurt people or... or or otherwise destroy other people's lives, and then we go like, ah, oh, but it's just a piece of code. Yeah, and and I think you know that comes down to a lot of stuff, also in the ethics space. Is yeah. this okay to build to begin with? Uh, and, and you know, what's my personal or, or corporate ethic in going into to to things? So 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 there's there's a lot of things kind of 
crossing boundaries here uh, yeah. on the topic of, of you know the, the importance of systems and reliability of systems okay let's bring in the next question which is also a little bit about errors here it says over planning for errors can also be pro problematic from time to market business performance costs or other perspectives uh, do you have any good tips for good principles to follow when navigating this um work out what might go wrong figure out what it would cost don't spend the money but keep an account of how much money you didn't spend and you know I frequently have that conversation with uh, you know stakeholders finance everything because then when you go to them and go right we actually need to spend some money now you can back it up with something going look we saved this much like here here's the the 100,000 euros worth of stuff we didn't spend last year because we decided together to accept this risk um we believe the risk is no longer acceptable and so now we need to actually invest in in safeguards or backups or failovers or or all this kind of stuff um you know it is uh the the informed choice not to do something it's the difference between you just go i don't care about insurance and going i've got quotes I know how much it would cost. I know how much cover we would get. I have compared that to profit and loss, and I've decided that it is not the right thing for us to do right now. And those are, you end up with the same outcome, which is we have no insurance, but the process that got you there is very, very different. And one of them puts you in a much better place to understand at what point it becomes necessary to revisit some of your assumptions regarding risk and stuff. Um, you know, it's a, uh, that, that's, I think, the, the single, because that applies across a whole bunch of things, technical debt, uh, you know, failover, redundant systems, backups, even just down, you know, having people on your team who uh, are there in case the rest of the team are on holiday and something goes wrong. Uh, you know, all those kinds of things, whether you do it or don't do it, figure out what it would have cost to do it and keep track of that because then um, you're making a far more informed decision. I'm exactly with Dylan on this. I, I think, you know, I, I already mentioned threat modeling before and, and I think, you know, just apply the same idea you know, what could possibly go wrong? How how big is the, the risk that it goes wrong? What will it cost when it goes wrong? And, you know, what would the fix cost? And then kind of uh, chuck it up to a business decision saying like these things we probably need to deal with because they're likely. These things maybe not so likely, really expensive to fix uh, or really expensive to mitigate. Let's just be aware that they could happen. And you, we put that on our awareness list. Yeah. And you're in a much better situation than than just kind of happy-go-lucky. And and these things don't have to take a lot of time. I've done this in a room with a team for two hours, just just kind of brainstorming ideas and and you know be open-minded, be like an elephant crushes the server. All right, you know probably not going to happen. Yeah. We don't need to buy elephant protection uh, for, for our servers. One of the the um, infosec people I used to work with used to run like tabletop gaming sessions mm -hmm. for uh, you got to break into the company, you got to you know steal all the data, and you had to come up with with characters and scenarios and you know it was fun, but also at some point in the meeting you'd see like one of the senior people suddenly go, oh that could happen oh crap and and exactly. you know we had we had one where it was a um a, a, a former database contractor we're like well what what if one of the people who did that contract work on our database last year what if one of them got really deep into the whole like you know conspiracy theory lizard people thing um and decided that we were part of the illuminati and everyone looked around the table because they all knew exactly which person this character was based on and i'm like we made sure they'd have no access right it's like yeah, yeah it's fine it's fine so <laughs> Okay. I think this next question actually touches a little bit on some of the things that have brought up in terms of uh, keeping a log, like you said, Dylan, about keeping a log about how much money you perhaps would have put on it and, and didn't. Uh, and it's how can individual organizations concerned with unacknowledged risks get them addressed before a catastrophic failure? Million dollar question. <laughs> it might be a million. We don't know. They don't have the logs. so. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I mean, that, that, that's tough. You know, there are different companies, different cultures are different. Uh, one of the things that can help, n maybe not immediately in your situation, but it's a good skill to develop is working out how to articulate the risk in a way that makes it 
something other people can understand. You know, uh, engineers and software developers, historically, we speak in jargon and we look at our shoes and we're terrible at having conversations. And, you know, learn to, an example of this was um, not necessarily reliability, but I think it's quite a good example is website performance. You know, you got marketing saying the website needs to be faster. And you're like, oh, wow. and eventually, you know, I sat down, I was like, look, we, we've, uh, this is uh, 500 milliseconds, what we call 500 milliseconds time to first bite. Um, and this will be for 90% of our customers. So 90% of them, and I sit them down, I'm like, this is what it feels like. And then I'm like, and then the other 10%, and you tweak the little thing in, in Fiddler, so you're throttling the traffic. Other 10%, it's gonna feel like this. And they're like, yeah, that is a bit slow. And you're like, well, let me make it a little faster. And eventually you're like, right, now if we turn this all the way up, uh, that'll mean hiring another three developers and paying an extra 5,000 a month for hosting. And this is how fast we could get it. And they're like, oh, okay. And it, you, you kind of, you know, you reach a level between the two or it's like okay we can spend this much we get that much you're happy that 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 is a good kind of cost benefit analysis and uh, you know risk is um you know you go to someone and you're like oh uh, and it can be really scary you're like uh yeah uh the backups didn't work and if it happens again the whole company might fall over and they're like well what's the solution you're like well we we've uh, we have a 200 gig tape drive and last night we had 201 gigs of backups and it's only getting bigger so uh, basically from right now we have no business continuity until you give us 10,000 pounds to buy a new tape drive and then it won't be here for 3 weeks mm -hmm. and you know that's not a terribly constructive conversation from either side um and it's not constructive because you should have seen it coming. You know, like, okay, 190, 191, 192. And, you know, a lot of those, uh, you know, awareness of, of risk is not just, hey, a bad thing might happen in the future. And they're like, well, how bad? You're like, very bad. How soon? <laughs> oh, very soon. All right. How much? Lots. <laughs> you know, that's not. And a lot of it comes down to a bad thing might happen. And you want to be like, look, see this, this line here? Uh, this is the... Um, CPU capacity on our main database cluster, and it's been going up. And uh, when it gets to this point here, which uh, this graph is going to happen in about four months, then we're going to start seeing people can't connect, people can't uh, submit transactions, all this kind of stuff is going to happen. Um, so what we think we need to do is at this point, we need to spend this much money, um, you know, your call. And, you know, it's, it's finance people love it when you go to them and say, can we put this in the budget for the next quarter? because they're like, I haven't made the spreadsheet for that yet. Yes, we can. At this point, it's, and then we'll figure out how to balance it. If you go to them right now and say, we need another 10,000, they're like, we don't have another, or maybe we do, but we don't have a, you know, we haven't accounted for that in the way we're going to be forecasting revenue for this quarter. So. Um, I, I, I think the positive thing here is that the, the generally looking at most companies with the, how the trend is going, they understand that, you know, digital is here to stay it's not like a project this is like the new normal so all of a sudden we see the the investments being the being easier to get i still think that you know the point that dylan taught touches upon is, is super important which you know i've been talking a, a long time that developers should get into sales and i don't mean sales of goods and services just say, sales of ideas there's a great book called spin selling and just read that because that that talks about empathy, about understanding the person you're talking to, kind of getting into their situation and then trying to explain what you're trying to sell them from their perspective. And, and that helps a lot because if we go there with jargon and we go there with tech stuff and, and then we try to convince somebody about something that's actually a really good idea for the business, but we're doing it from the wrong framing or from the wrong perspective. We're not going to be successful in selling that idea. Thankfully, we have to do less and less of that. But I think that's a good skill for everyone to have. Yeah. Right. Whatever well, the you questions... want to do. With... Yeah. <laughs> no, no, sorry. I was just going to say, whatever you want to do with your life, learning how to articulate your ideas in a way that makes other people um, enthusiastic about them is just an incredibly valuable talent to develop. It really is. Would, it, wouldn't it be great if everyone had it? <laughs> <laughs> uh, the questions have been flying in now, so I'm going to really try and make you boys pick up the pace here a little bit. Uh, stop having so much fun and get right. the questions answered, please. <laughs> uh, looking back in time based on failures, what is the single best lesson we can learn from it? They're going to happen. Don't pretend they won't. If you pretend they won't, when they will, they'll wipe you out. Next. <laughs> Martin, anything to add? <laughs> Next. Right, you can have a little bit of fun. <laughs> <laughs> 
Okay, this one's a juicy one, I think. Uh, it's uh, what's the worst failure you've seen and can talk about? I this is this is interesting actually because the one that I want to talk about and can talk about was could have been catastrophic and it wasn't but uh, what had happened is uh, we were running five web servers in a in a cluster and through some uh, problem with configuration um, four of them were connecting to the main production database and one of them had somehow gone live with a connection string pointing to a developer's workstation and uh, this is a long, long time ago. So this was, was pre-GDPR and stuff. And uh, the, there was a, enough of a database replica on that devs machine that it wasn't immediately obvious that anything had gone wrong. You know, the searches still worked. Pages were coming back. Performance was OK. But it meant that 20% of transactions, purchases, you know, um, were going onto somebody's hard drive instead of into the data center. And so the same invoice numbers were getting reused because of key generation strategies and stuff. And uh, we, it took us about 36 hours to realize what was wrong because nothing was down. Everything was still, still up. And eventually we're like, that's really weird. You know, we've got an invoice here. The customer's emailed us and it's definitely real and we can see it and the money's in the bank, but we can't find it in the database. Where is it? And we went digging. We're like, oh, okay. Right. When did this go? And then, you know, we it took probably four or five days to write a program that would replay those transactions out of that database and into the real one and update all the references and line everything back up together. And, uh, you know, that was that was the one that, you know, I, I'm like 36 hours. What if we hadn't noticed for a week? You know, what if we, we hadn't noticed for a month? What if we, we hadn't noticed and that machine had been reformatted? And then we're like, oh, now we have a real problem because we have a bunch of money in the bank and we don't know where it came from. Um, and you know that that was a we kind of we dodged a bullet and uh, learned a lot from the experience. But uh, you know we've done data centers downtime and you know systems failing and overheating and not enough air conditioning in the server and all those. But those kind of everyone has had those. You know those are kind of part of the course. Um, but that one was that one was interesting. That one was genuinely like. You know, it didn't fail. It wasn't a timeout. It wasn't an error message. It was that that third failure scenario I talked about, where the machine looks like it's doing the right thing, but it's doing the wrong thing, and nobody notices for a while. So, yeah, that that was that was interesting. <laughs> I, I, I think, again, again, you know, I think the most interesting failures are the people failures. I mean, when machines fail, they tend to fail predictably. I, I think <laughs> most of my most of my big kind of failure scenarios come from when I was working uh, like online, online selling or online retail uh, with a client uh, because those are heated. And it's usually somebody screwed something up. We had, you know, one person delete the whole production database because they had a wrong connection string. That that's an issue, and you know not, now you have a, a timer in your back. How much money you're losing every every you know every second the site is down. I myself I, I uh, rewrote the credit card processing, which made credit card processing fail for only one type of product. So this took days to discover because it was only failing <laughs> for that one specific type of product. Uh, and you know we calculated that, and that amounted up to like two hundred fifty thousand kroner at the end of lost sales, probably because people are trying to purchase this product and just removing it from their baskets to, to do checkout. And they weren't error reporting it. And mm -hmm. this is the, the weird thing. So this is going on for days and people are just like, I'm just happy not to buy that thing and just move on with my life. Um, but all of those were just like, you know, it's just like people screwed up at some point, like the computers and network and everything is just doing what it's supposed to do, but just, we screwed up. Yeah. I mean, I could I could talk all day about interesting failures and just interesting. Uh, as, as one other one which was was interesting. Uh, we we did a, a graph of usage activity for one of our big customers. It's how many people from your organization are using our platform. And one year it just fell off a cliff and it started just down 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 until basically nothing. I'm like, what is going on here? Um, and you know, looked at it, looked at it, and uh, what was happening is uh, the connection string, the browser user agent. Every time they installed like a Windows update or a .NET service pack, it got a little bit longer. And when it got to 
uh, 128 characters, the database was discarding those requests because it was a, a binary overflow. Um, but it wasn't logging the error. Somebody had commented out the, the catch block in the in the exception. Um, and it wasn't like, you know, at the time it was like, uh, OK, if we can't log a site visit, that doesn't matter. Just get rid of it. Just, you know. Um, and then, it, you know, years later, it's like, actually, we're using that to negotiate a really, really lucrative contract. Um, but the weird thing is, you know, every time that the client got a bunch of new workstations, they plug them in, and suddenly the traffic would go up because all those workstations hadn't been patched yet, so their user agents were still short. And then as the updates rolled out, it would start declining. So it was a perfect organic decline mm -hmm. pattern. It looked exactly like it would if one by one all the people in that company were going, we're not using your system anymore. We're going somewhere else. Um, but it wasn't. It was a, just a, a database logging, uh, you know, overflowing a string field and discarding the error. And all right. Was I know we're on tight schedule, but I need to get this in. On, on <laughs> oh. one, I was just one, about to say. One, one other interesting thing that, that actually happened was the CSS, CSS reaching 10,000 lines of code. <laughs> uh, which for I can't remember what browser I think it was one of the IE browsers. Yeah. It just didn't fail. It just stopped reading the CSS after that like amount of of uh, lines or characters or can't remember the exact detail. And since the CSS was built, it just gave random uh, behaviors on every build. I, you know, I, th I think that the yeah. front end people were were just screaming. Uh, to figure it out, uh, what what was going on, and you know you shouldn't have CSSs that long anyway. Yeah. But you know in this particular situation, uh, legacy code base, but that yeah. that was horrible to figure yeah. out why it was <laughs> failing, just because the bug yeah. reports were so choppy. Okay. I'm sure we could do this all day, but yes. Victoria, <laughs> you're not going to. <laughs> Next question: uh, The effort to understand the internals of the system probably increases with the use of neural networks, most considered as black boxes. How would you deal with such systems in terms of reliability? <laughs> now that's that's really interesting because you know what what Martin just said about the interesting failures are people failures. Um, I can see a point in my lifetime when we don't get engineers to fix neural networks, we get therapists because the patterns of you know behavior and input output and that kind of stuff is going to go beyond the point where you know you in theory you could analyze the human brain as an electrical system we vaguely know you know we don't know exactly how it works but we know that that it's neurons and and electrical signals and that's somehow that turns into consciousness if you do enough of it and we're approaching that from the other direction but you would never get an electrical engineer to try and diagnose you know depression or anxiety or any of these kinds of things um and i think we're going to sort of start seeing an overlap about uh, systems where it is no longer possible to take them apart and see how they work. All you can do is see how they respond to certain sets of input and output and you know, and hypothesize based on that, uh, we think the problem might be this. And you know, we're already kind of seeing that with some of the, the stuff about inherent bias in training data sets for machine learning. You know, you get a the, the classic uh, um, you know, oh, we made a racist algorithm. It's like, well, no, you, you took a perfectly good algorithm and you trained it on information you found on the internet, which is not a very well-balanced place to get information from. Of course, it's going to come out with tendencies and bias and all that kind of stuff. And we're getting to a point where, you know, more people understand the, the risks around that. But we're certainly not, you know, we, we've way past the point where it's like, oh, the, the algorithm is biased in favor of white male faces because this line of code here is wrong. Let's fix the bug and then it's done. We know that we, we're past that point and there's no going back. We're just not quite sure what we do, you know, for the, the, the sort of next generation of, of diagnosing and, and improving the, the reliability and I guess the fairness, you know, the, the making systems that work for everybody, not just for the, the, the people in the office where they develop them. I think I think we have two camps in this, right? We have the camp of, of people that say like eventually these things will grow so complex we don't know what they're doing. And we have the camp saying, you know, we've created these things so we we will always be able to kind of open and debug and, and understand how you know how, what is happening in a much broader sense than the human brain. Yeah. And, and, and 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 you know, I don't know, most of the people I spoke to that are on on research of, of AI, not not in like using it, but like researching it. Say that we will, as we grow the complexity of them, we will also grow the tools to analyze 
and kind of reverse engineer them and maybe even clean them up in a sense of, you know, once we trained it, we can, you know, create statistical models for those things and then make better uh, algorithms that are not purely trained, but that are also kind of uh, cleaned in a sense of how they work. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, I'm not an expert in these things. This is just, just you know, from discussions I've been having. But I do believe that there is at least a belief or a, that, that we will be able to open these things up and debug them uh, at some point. Would you think it's fair to say that the, the diagnostic tools will always be a couple of steps behind the state of the art in terms of the, the machine learning models themselves? So, so I, I think it depends on who drives the evolution, right? So, 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 so if we see, if we see companies and capital drive, uh, drive, yep. yes. If we see research drive, no, because I think researchers are are very, very much inclined to analyzing what they create in order to write their reporting and, and yeah. you know, things like that. So I say think they are very much uh, want the diagnostics tools uh, to to be better. But if we see, you know business and corporate drive it definitely they they're like i don't care if it works it works put it in production i don't care why it works just run with it uh so, so i think there there's going to be um I, it, we need a balance we need a balance between yeah. uh, business and, and research yeah okay. i think <laughs> we've got time to yeah. check in two quick questions uh, right. here before we have to wrap it on up uh what is your take on the future of public cloud platforms will darkness like Shrims, is it pronounced? Shrims? Scrims? Two? I never heard of it. S C H R E M S. <laughs> Go do you away know what that is, Martin? Yeah. Oh, you do? Good. Whew. Otherwise, we'd <laughs> skip this one. Uh, will the things like this go away and even governments allow themselves to be in the hands of the US cloud providers? Uh, whew. Uh... I'm not a lawyer. <laughs> I, don't know um, I, I think I think it, it is a problem. Uh, I don't know how it will be tackled or, or if it will be tackled. I think there is an opportunity for European uh, cloud providers. But that said, I think it's EU needs to step their shit up because there's, you know, US would never allow American interests to be put in China or the European yeah. Union in that way. China and Russia would never allow their interests to be put in EU in that way. So like EU putting their interests uh, and faith in, in companies that are primarily American and, you know, governed by American law and just being like, oh, we're fine with that because they say to have a European office but they can still be subpoenaed to give out you know information from those servers because at, at the end of the day they are a, a, a u.s company it, it's it's more of like an eu issue of eu not kind of stepping up their game and being like you know we, we need to take responsibility for the countries and the citizens of those countries that are in the union and their data and their interests so, so I, I do believe that it's it's a cultural problem uh, because you know China doesn't do it, Russia doesn't do it, U.S. doesn't do it, it you know. But but the countries in the in the European Union are just like no, no, we're completely fine. Like whatever you yeah. want. Like uh, there's a, an interesting you know idea. Imagine a country they had a, a nationalized cloud platform that's like we give you infrastructure, we give you you know networking, hosting, scaling, um, and we give you identity and authentication. So if you want to build something that serves citizens of this country and, you know, host that as part of a kind of, you know, government or a nationalized uh, body, the government gets the revenue. They put that back into, you know, not just internet infrastructure, but all the other stuff governments do. Um, you don't have to worry about verification and, you know, authentication. Uh, you know, I don't think, I'm not aware of anyone's doing that. Estonia is probably the closest with things like their, you know, digital passport schemes and that kind of stuff. Um, but that's an interesting idea. Why does nobody like nationalize the cloud and be like, yeah, you want to build services that, that run in this country for citizens of this country? Here is our platform. And, uh, you know, instead of uh, Silicon Valley millionaires getting rich, it actually puts some cash back into the economy that keeps the countries going. But okay. yeah, I, I, don't, I don't believe we've seen the end of this. I think this is still to, to be decided. <laughs> I, you know, I'm, 
I'm kind of okay with with still using the the cloud platforms as they are, but but you know for certain applications this is definitely an issue. Okay, we're going to have to wrap it up there because that one was a lot more detailed than I had envisioned. But I think I'm going to take your words there, Dylan, of nationalize the cloud. That's where <laughs> we're going with this. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. It's been a really really great discussion. I wish it could carry on and go on, but unlike well D dylan's done for the day we've still got work to be getting on with and i'm sure everyone else has too so thank you so much for joining us dylan and martin and also a big thanks to the heroes behind the scenes to both marcus Masur and axel for making this happen and also to nate the genius behind the the stream that's been going on today uh, our next knowledge gathering will actually be happening at the end of the month on the 31st of may we have Joachim sandian who will be joining us to be talking about scaling agile so make sure you keep your eyes and ears open for more information about that heading your way. You can catch this a little bit later on, along with any of the other streams that we've done, including both Dylan's uh, Leet Speak talk and Martin Mazur's uh, Leet Speak keynotes that he's uh, done a couple of on our YouTube channel. So you can just pop in there and catch up on those. So. Aside from that, I hope you've had a really great morning. I hope it's given you energy for the rest of the day, and we'll see you again soon. Goodbye. Take care, everyone. Take Bye. care. Bye.